like that. This morning. Oh, 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 there we go. Beautiful. So this morning, I got to show off these cool whiz bang. Check out this thing. Check out that thing. That's amazing. Whoa, I can fix Scott's coat. That's amazing, too. Um, and that's amazing. And I think today what I'm going to do is show you more amazing stuff. Uh, you can just hashtag amazing Xamarin and everything. That'll be my big buzzword for this, uh, <laughs> for this one. Because uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to get into some of the internals of Xamarin Forms. Uh, while I like to always show off the new and shiny uh, and look at all the really great things that you can do with Xamarin and Xamarin Forms and the live player and all the great tools and integrations, a lot of times you want to know what else you can do once you're one month into your project, six months into your project, a year into your project, or heck, you're upgrading Xamarin Forms from 1.0 to 2.0 to 3.0. What's in that stuff? How can I make sure that I'm taking advantage of the latest and greatest inside of Xamarin and Xamarin Forms? So what I'm going to do today is walk through what is Xamarin Forms just really quick in case anyone is kind of new to the world of Xamarin and Xamarin Forms development. But then I'm going to get into all the nitty gritty awesome stuff that is built into Xamarin Forms and some things that were just released and are about to be released that you can take advantage of. So if you're having some issues with your app, you're going to see some awesome tips. If you're just getting started with Xamarin Forms, you're going to see some great new things. So when you go back and start developing your iOS, Android, and Windows apps with Xamarin and Xamarin Forms, you'll know what to do from day one. Now, if you don't know who I am, I'm James Montemagno. I'm a principal program manager here at Microsoft looking at all of our mobile developer tools. Seven years ago, I started the journey as a small solo developer at a very small startup building all of their iOS, Android, and Windows applications. I found Xamarin and I fell in love. I just love it so much that I joined Xamarin five years ago and then I joined Microsoft. I just love talking to developers around the globe to show them that Xamarin is the best way to build mobile applications for any single platform. Now I live here in this bright sunshiny city of Seattle, Washington. I made the big voyage over. This is my third time in Spain. I love every single city that I visited, uh, all of them. I love it. Uh, it is second on my list of places to move. Taiwan is still my number one. So you guys are close. You're inching up there. I still need to learn Spanish. It's on my list. Uh, I let my girlfriend do all the Spanish speaking. She's a Spanish major, so I get the easy pass. Uh, but I moved there seven years ago to become a mobile developer. Um, and I did so because I found that we had this power, this supercomputer in our pocket, and I loved it. I also moved to Seattle because I have a lot of coffee. And I drink a lot of coffee. Um, but I still build tons of mobile apps and tons of libraries that maybe some of you have been using recently. Uh, now, what's great is that you can contact me anytime for anything. That's my direct email. It goes right into my e inbox, mots at Microsoft.com. That's my blog. That's my Twitter. So contact me if you have any questions. All of these slides are on SlideShare, so everything's available. If you have any questions about anything at all, even if you're in Seattle sometime, want some coffee, contact me. If you want more Xamarin awesomeness, uh, I have more of that for you because I can't stop talking about it. I have a podcast that I do called Merge Conflict, where I talk about all sorts of things in the world of mobile development, and a show on Channel 9 that's called The Xamarin Show. And every single week, I release a new episode uh, with some people from the community and some people at Xamarin and Microsoft talking about everything that you can do with Xamarin. But let's get into Xamarin and Xamarin Forms. The reason I fell in love with Xamarin was because of this unique approach, sharing a bulk of my business logic on my models, view models, RESTful service calls, and building out native user interfaces across each platform. Now, with Xamarin Forms, we said, well, developers love that they have access to 100% of the APIs. They love that they can craft native UIs, but they want to share more code. And especially if you're in the enterprise, and you're building a lot of applications, a line of business applications, you need to build them even faster. You need to build them in weeks, not months. So that's why we developed Xamarin Forms, an abstraction of all common UI controls from iOS, Android, and Windows. And it's evolved into more platforms that I'll talk about. And you can access all of these controls from XAML or C Sharp code behind, whatever you would like. Now what's great is that with this development approach, just like Xamarin, you get that shared C-sharp backend, but you get more shared code on the front end. This is a slide that I showed earlier. And we've made it really easy to mix and match these two. So if you have an existing Xamarin app, you can easily put in a Xamarin Forms page into your app. So you don't have to rewrite the entire thing. 
or vice versa. You can easily bring over a native page from Xamarin into a Xamarin Forms app because under the hood, they're just a Xamarin app. It's just the UI that you're using. Now, included in Xamarin Forms is more than just a UI toolkit. We do have 40 plus pages, layouts, and controls that we're continuing to add more to and even more soon. But it includes an entire MVVM toolkit. So you have uh, full two-way data binding. Uh, you have converters, behaviors, uh, events, all these things that you'd be used to in the world of MVVM. Uh, a navigation system, an animation API that uses the underlying animation systems, and a full dependency service and messaging center that I'll talk a little bit about today. Now these pages and layouts, they give you ways of laying out controls. So a fly out master detail navigation, tabbed page, carousel, and then layouts such as absolute, grid, or stack layout to put all of your controls on the page. And then there are the controls. So at a core, we said, what can we abstract and do a common API? So we see some things such as buttons and labels and list views and maps, things that are the same. We put those all into a single API, but we also make it extensible. So you can add your own custom controls. We can add more in the future, but we're also working with a lot of control partners like Telerik and Infragistics and Syncfusion that have built charts and graphs and Kanban boards for iOS and Android and Xamarin, and now cross-platform with Xamarin Forms. So if there's something that's not in the box, you can build it yourself, you can see what the open source community is doing, or look at one of our amazing partners building things for Xamarin and Xamarin Forms. Now a traditional page, I'll kind of walk through what it would look like for this login page across iOS, Android, and Windows. Uh, and here is a tabbed page, and that's the core of it. And inside of it is two content pages. The first one uh, is going to be the login page, and I have two entries and a button. We can see some data binding to username and password. Is password is set to true? What that will do is under the hood set the specific property to ensure that it has the little asterisks when someone enters their password. And then we have a button. We can see different uh, text color with both uh, white and then background with a hex color and a data binding to a command. So when someone taps login, it will call that method in the code behind. And then we have another page for settings. And the reason I like to show this at a very simple level is that you get iOS tabs on the bottom, tabs on top, and tabs on Windows. So you're getting the native user interface on each. So UI uh, a tab navigation controller, uh, material tabs on Android, and a tabs page on Windows. So you still get the native user interface even though you are writing everything in cross-platform XAML. And that's what's important about Xamarin is 100% native. So I figure what I do is really quick walk through an application and some of the infrastructure and we'll continue to iterate and build upon it and make it better during the next 40 minutes or so. So this is my weather application. Uh, it's an application that I've, I've built and tweaked and upgraded Xamarin Forms throughout all of the years and added new functionality as Xamarin and Xamarin Forms um, continues to grow. So when I go on here, I have my Windows, Android, and iOS application. I have my screen mirroring Android, I have our remote iOS simulator here, and a UWP application. So I can come in and I have some toggles that we can see. Uh, I can toggle between Imperial or Metric on them. Uh, I can say get weather. This is going to call an open weather API. Is now everything is talking to me. Because at the same time, I'm also doing text-to-speech to read back uh, the actual temperature. I can come in and look at my forecast. And since I'm on a touch screen, you know, I can actually swipe, and I would get the correct controls on each of them that I would expect. Same thing on iOS. So we can see in Seattle, it's going to be very rainy. That's pretty and cloudy. That's pretty, pretty similar. But we're getting the native iOS tabs, Android tabs, and I have icons, everything that I would expect from my applications. I can use native features, of course, so I can come in and use GPS location here. This will go out for both Android and iOS and the should be, yep. yeah, so it got the Madrid temperature in both of them. Apparently, it looks like it's a little bit different in the last 10 seconds, so that's good. Real, real time data that's happening here. And these are hitting RESTful endpoints, sharing all the code. And in fact, at this point in this application, 99% of the application is shared between iOS, Android, and Windows. And if I come into the source code, 
what we're going to see is that I have a, a traditional Xamarin, Android, iOS, and Windows application. Now down here, I have some services for geolocation, settings, and text-to-speech, which I'll get to in a little bit. But at the high level, I have a main weather view. And this weather view here uh, has some grids in rows. I have an entry here, which is pretty nice. One thing that we're seeing right there is if I toggle on and off the GPS, I can't actually type inside of here anymore. So it actually disables it. So we have data triggers and, and event triggers built right in to Xamarin Forms. And then I have labels and switches. And these are being data bound to some code behind of use GPS, use Imperial, and get weather. Uh, I also have an ad control. And if ads were working over on Android, we should see that in a little bit uh, pop up. Now, what I like is that that view model is right here, and it's shared between those pages. So a few things that we'll see is I have this weather service. I have a public location, a Boolean for use GPS, use Imperial. And I'm not only setting the property, I'm also saving this into the setting so it remembers what I'm using. I have the temperature, condition. And then what I have down here is this execute. What I like about this is a pretty good example of, hey, if I want to use uh, GPS, let me check my permissions. Let me get my current position asynchronously. Let me get the weather from our weather service and then format all of our results and do a little text-to-speech. And inside of our weather service here, I'm hitting that Open Weather Map API. So it's just a bunch of JSON. So if I go into my uh, weather city here, there we go. I should be able to come into, let's say, Chrome. Paste it in there. And if I go and say, Seattle, it should hit that Open Weather uh, API. And then there's my JSON that I'm parsing. So um, I have all that JSON, um, and I can go to quicktype.io, which is a really cool website that allows me to take this JSON and convert it into a bunch of different languages. So here I can convert it into C Sharp, and it'll generate all of the classes for me. So that's quicktype.io. There's also an extension for Visual Studio and Visual Studio for Code. It's made by some amazing Microsoft employees. And you can do it to any. So if you're using TypeScript or any other language, I don't know why you would, but um, you know, there's C Sharp. That's all you need. So quicktype.io, I will, I will zoom in there. It's pretty, pretty sweet. Um, so that's what I did. And in fact, all of those models here are, are inside of here. So it's the same thing that I just showed you. So all of those nice prettified JSON with JSON.net. This weather service goes out. It uh, formats some strings, deserialize it, returns it back to the root. So my models are shared, my view models, my services. Um, I'm accessing native features and my shared code. And that's my app as of today. So now we can go and start extending this puppy. So let's go ahead and talk about that. And I really like to start off with some things that have been around that you may not have known about that are really awesome inside of Xamarin Forms. And I like to call them quick tips. Because these are things, little nuggets of awesomeness that are built in that you can take advantage of. The first thing is our messaging center. And often you may have different components of your application that need to communicate, like pub sub, your first page needs to talk to your second page, or you're running a background task that needs to update the UI thread, but it needs to access a view model to view model. Well, it's hard unless you, you know, access a bunch of static properties, or maybe you need to do something when the app loads. Well, with the messaging center, it sits in the middle and will do a pub sub, so publish and subscription model. So here, our master page of our application is subscribing to events whenever a new item is added. And then the detail page can send it across to the messaging center, and it will be received. It's a very loose coupling. So this is what the code will look like here. Messaging center will say, hey, I'm expecting a new expense. I'll give it a string of add new, and I'm going to do something with it immediately, add it to a list. It's just going to call a function here. And then the detail page just needs to send it. There's no, it's built right into Xamarin Forms. Nothing else, no other NuGet package that you need. So it's built in and it's optimized, and Xamarin Forms uses it itself at its core. That's been there since like 1.0. And for some reason, no one still knows it exists. So I like to always mention it. 
platform customization is super simple. We have um, optimized our XAML for uh, this platform.on. So if your designer comes to you need to tweak a page here or there, this is built right in. Here what I'm doing is on iOS, I'm giving it a little bit more padding on top. I kind of gave it a very verbose uh, level, but I use this all throughout the code. When on Android, I want to make this background color something else or a little bit of spacing over here. You don't need to write a bunch of code um, to do that. This is all compiled and parsed automatically for you um, when you build your application. Now let's talk about XAML and compilation. Now out of the box, what happens today and maybe your existing application is you have a bunch of XAML and you write it, and what happens is nothing is compiled. It's all parsed and inflated at runtime. And this is the traditional way that we did it, because we didn't have XAML compilation. Now there's some benefits here that it is faster to compile your app, because you don't need to compile anything, so that's cool. But you lose out on the fact that you're not compiling your XAML, so you don't get to see errors. And also, um, it takes some time to parse and inflate it. So we created something called XAML compilation or XAML C. And the difference here is that you can parse and turn it into IL at compile time. This gives you error checking. It also means that since your XAML is compiled into IL, it's also smaller and faster. It's really easy to turn on. All of our new templates have it turned on by default. At an assembly level, in any assembly level that has Xamarin forms in it, you need to add this attribute. So XAML compilation, XAML compilation options compile. That'll compile every single XAML page inside of that assembly. So if you have some pages just in iOS, just in Android, or in your shared code, you want to put it everywhere. Now, if you have really complex things, you're running into some edge case, you're like, I'm a little worried that this is going to mess up my app, you could turn it on on a page by page or control by control basis. You just drop that assembly. That's it. Additionally, this class will override the assembly. So if you turn the assembly on for everything, but skip this crazy page where who knows what the heck you're doing because you're using 8,000 custom controls from a bunch of different vendors, you can just turn it off for that page. Everything else will be compiled except for that one page if you use skip. So super awesome, built right in. Then you're saying, well, that's great. My, you know, comp I'm compiling, that's great, but I'm using my app and I don't know, it's like slow and Android's running out of memory and you know, maybe it's because I'm downloading 10 meg images and trying to display it in a little 10 by 10 box. I don't know, that may be your issue, I don't know. Um, maybe not best practice, but sometimes you don't have control. And this is the biggest complaint that I hear from developers building Android apps at all. Even Z Android native Java apps or Xamarin native apps is that these huge apps are destroying, these huge images are destroying my app. I'm running out of memory, low end things, can't handle it. So we fixed that. Um, and we fixed it by introducing a, a version of Glide, which is an optimized Android library for image downloading and caching. And we created something called Glide X. And it's a slimmed down version because Glide does a bunch of stuff. So what we did is we created Glide X for Android apps and Glide X forms for Xamarin Android apps. And what this does is it'll work exactly the same with all of your images out of the box, and it optimizes the memory and usage on all of them. And it takes a single line of code to set up. So what we did here is we optimized it, and we took a look at peak memory usage for a bunch of different images inside of different controls. So some of them are virtualized and some of them aren't. So on a grid page with all these huge images, our max load was 268 megs. That's a lot of image. With GlideX, the same exact page went down to 16 megabytes of in-memory usage. That's crazy. The view cell page, which is a built-in page, had about 94 megs, went down to 12 megs. An image cell page, which is an optimized image view, 24 down to nine. Then huge image page, we call it, is all of the hum huge images that we could find. Uh, was at 267, went down to 9. Some of these are JPEG, some of them are PNG, right? But that is a dramatic, dramatic difference. So not only is it going to optimize the downloading and fading and everything of your images in your application, but it's going to ensure that as your users are scrolling, it's buttery smooth. So if you have any Im issues, this is your solution. And it's super easy. This is what you do. You install a NuGet package, and you say, in it. 
Android Glide forms in it, and you're done. You don't have to do anything else. All of your images stay the same, and it's super optimized because it's Android native code. So it handles all of the memory usage for you automatically. It works with web URLs, files on disks, drawables, and byte arrays, so everything that's built in. So if you haven't used GlideX yet, give it a shot. All right. Now, huge images are a problem. Huge images and list views are also a problem. And a lot of people, I, I love, I, I created the Evolve Conference app a while ago, and I gave it to our MVPs. I love our MVPs. And they go, man, James, this, this scroll view is just a little, they go, I'm like, it's fine when I go like this, but when I go like this, real users, it's a little bit jarring. And I was like, oh, I forgot to turn on some optimizations. So let's talk about the list view because list views are most of our apps. Now, built right into the list view is a caching strategy. Guess what? Caching is off by default. It's off by default because that was the only option in 1.0. And we didn't want to change the default behavior. We didn't want to break anybody, so it's off. And that's, that kind of stinks because you'd imagine you just had a list view and it's optimized, right? Nope. Um, retain element says every time I scroll, create a new cell every time. Now, this has its advantages if the cell is really complex, just it's really different, really out there. Maybe rethink your cell at that point. Um, but that's what it's there for. There's a recycle element, and we added a new one. This was new to me uh, until recent, which is recycle element and data template. Uh, recycle element says, I'm going to just recycle every cell. So every cell, we, um, we can cache how many templates you have inside of it. So this is good when we use data templates, which I'll show here in a second. And then recently, we added recycle element and data template. So it uses the same cells but updates the data bindings. The difference here, this new, new, new one, recycle element and data template, if you only have one data template, it will cache that one in memory. So it won't have to create new data templates every single time. So it actually is more optimized the more you go down, so based on your app. So maybe a year ago, you were like, oh, I know about this, James, I use recycle element. You could get even more performance by using recycle element and data template. So this is going to improve scrolling performance. And again, remember, retain element is the default. So you want to add this immediately. It's super easy, too. Uh, it's just a property. So caching strategy, pass in recycle element. Uh, and here, uh, in the list view, if you're creating it from the code behind, just pass into the constructor. That's it. So simple to do and really improves the performance. Now, often, I mentioned that cells can be very complex. So for instance, here, this uh, chat application has similar cells, but they're actually dramatically different. They have different background colors. One image is on the right, one's on the left. Um, the text alignment is very different. And you say, well, James, I can create this. I'll you know, hide an image or show an image. I'll have a value converter. I'll have you know, another value converter for left or right, and I'll handle all of this. And that's fine. But the problem is that these data templates are actually dramatically different. So what we want to do is use a data template selector. And the data template selector says, for this type of data or this data with this property or whatever conditions you want, use this cell. Else, use this other cell. And that's when recycle element will cache those two data templates and recycle them. So that way it's super buttery smooth, even if your cells are dramatically different, especially with different sizes. And this, again, is really easy to set up. You can set it up in just a few lines of code. You create your view cell separately. So you create it separately uh, in new XAML pages or C Sharp pages. And what you do is create a data template selector. And there's one method you override called onSelectTemplate. And here I'm just saying, is it a weather root or some conditional? And return one or the other. That's all you have to do. And you can have a switch state. You can have as many as you want. There's really, uh, I don't think, any restrictions, maybe besides Android. I think you can have maybe 25 or 26 different cell types. And that's just like an Android restriction. So if you have more than 26, again, rethink you know, a little bit what's happening here. But this is amazing to set up. So um, here in the XAML, I just add it as a resource to my page and say weather template selector uh, inside the app. So let's go ahead and use some of these things inside the app really quick. So what I'm going to do is come over into my app. And the first thing I want to show you is my app page here. And this is where I was creating the tabbed page. So I was actually creating it in the code behind, just for funsies. So you can create some of this uh, in the code behind. 
I have the data binding and the weather routes there. I also have the main pages. That's pretty cool. And then I have that compile. So I compile it on for everything automatically inside my app. Now, if I go into my weather forecast, which I didn't show you earlier, this is my list view page. This is my list view that's here. I'm also using some of those uh, on platform types. So when I come into my uh, Android app, uh, my iOS app, and let me bring up my Android app here. It's going to yell at me again. Current temperature is 9.59 degrees Celsius. You can kind of see that there's no line on iOS, but there's a line in between the cells on, on Android here. It's a little scaled from screen mirroring because I'm saying on iOS, make it transparent, that separator color. And you can apply that to anything. Now, I have this data template, which is looking OK. But maybe I want to do something a little bit different uh, based on if it's rainy or not. Again, maybe move things to the left or to the right, some colors. I could accomplish that with, um, with converters. But I said, hey, let me just refactor this, this view cell. And I'm going to take that code. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put this into a normal data template selector, so just normal weather. And the first thing I did, actually, is I optimized the views. We can see I'm using a, a stack layout and another stack layout. That's bad. That's just bad code, James. Use a grid. It's much more optimized. So I use a grid here. And I have an image and two labels. And then I have a rain data template. The difference here is I set a different background color. I'm actually modifying the row, the spacing. I'm setting different text color. It's not dramatically different, but you get the point of what I'm doing. And then I also have this weather template selector, which is almost what you saw directly from the code. I create my instances to retain them so they're cached. And here what I'm doing is I'm making sure that I have a weather route and I'm checking the property is rainy. And I just return the correct data template there. So what I'm able to do is come in to my forecast view. And I'll come in here and I'll say item template. I'm going to say static resource. And I've added it right here. So this is where I add it. So this resource templates, which is coming in from this namespace. And I'm saying use weather template selector. And we've recently just redid all of our IntelliSense in Visual Studio 2017. So you can see that it's already smart enough to know that it's set multiple times. So I can go ahead and delete this here. There we go. Awesome. And now what I can do is I can go ahead and set that as my startup um, here. There's no other changes that I need to make in my code for this to work at all. I'm going to go redeploy it here on my uh, iOS simulator. So it should be over here. Give it a second to compile and then redeploy. I believe it should be compiling. There we go. Cool. It's doing it, doing it. Perfect. There we go. I always like to keep a picture of Hanselman on every simulator that I have, just right there. Just Scott always looking at me. It's just best practice for everyone. So there's my splash screen, or we're compiling. So I'm going to say get weather. My Mac's going to start talking. See, that's interesting, right? It's a simulator here, but my Mac's talking. Because it's actually over there, but it's here. It's magic. So here's my, my forecast view, and then there's my there's my dramatically different cells, right? So I have the rain on the right, and I can use this app to see if I go home, if it's going to be rainy, and it's always yes. It's always just rainy all the time. So that same exact code is now going to be optimized, works on iOS, works on Android, uh, exactly as I would expect uh, inside this application, which is super cool. All right. So optimize our list view. Uh, we have our recycle element. Now what's interesting here is if I would have done recycle element and data template, it would only cache the first one because it's optimizing that data template. That's why I only did recycle element there, which is um, pretty important. So just some quick tips. All right, let's get a little bit deeper into, into updating the user interface because those are some cool performance tips, but often we want to do more. There's a lot built into Xamarin Forms, but all, often you need to get outside of Xamarin Forms. You need to do some customization. You need some custom work. And that's where custom renderers come in. They give you the ability to jump outside and say, I have a custom control, and I want to integrate this into my app and put it into a shareable cross-platform API into my XAML, and I can do that. What's cool about custom renderers is that every control in Xamarin Forms is a custom renderer. 
So if you want every button of your app to look different, you can say, I'm going to create a custom renderer and override everything that a button looks like. So you can create your own button. Don't do that. That's a bad idea. But you could. Now, custom renderers were the only way of doing this for a long time. So a lot of apps have all these custom renders, and it kind of looks ugly. Um, and I'm going to tell you that you probably don't need custom renderers for whatever you're doing. You only need them for a few instances. Uh, when you have a complete custom page, so you need to load a custom UI view controller or, Zan or uh, Android XML page, you're creating a, a custom control, like a calendar or a circle image that does not exist inside the application. A lot of times I see uh, developers using custom renderers when they want to tweak one or two properties that aren't available. Like, oh, I need to change that little thing. Oh, I got to create a custom image. I got to take this corner rate. I got to do this thing. That's all this code. And the big problem here is that custom renderers can't stack on top of each other easily. You can't extend it. So if I have a custom image circle, I can't extend it again without having that NuGet package, and it's, it's bad. It's bad news for everyone. And additionally, Xamarin Forms needs to go through these layers to figure out what custom renderer to use. So that's why you most likely want to use an effect. Effects are a newer concept, and they're like a custom renderer, but they're like a light, super optimized version. And what's great is that you can implement it on a single platform or all the platforms. And you can think of it like lighting up a control, getting access to one or two properties, or changing a little bit of the functionality of a native control inside of Xamarin Forms. And the great part is that you can use this on any control. You can make them generic. You can make them for a specific image or, a, or, or entry or a, a third-party control easily. There's no life cycle to worry about, and you're not replacing the control. You're just adding to it. So what's cool is if you want to access this, you create this thing called a platform effect in the iOS or Android version. And you have two overrides, unattached, undetached. What happens when you show it? What happens when you don't show it? So in this instance, I'm going to add a border width, and I'm going to add a background color or border color of, of purple to this control. So really simple to implement. And let me show you what this looks like here inside the app. So what I'm going to do is uh, first come over into my iOS application here. In my iOS application, I have a effects folder. And I have an entry background effect. So it's, it's really simplistic. Uh, the first thing I do is I say that this is a platform effect. And notice that I'm going to be using this export effect property from Xamarin Forms. And it's entry background effect, entry background effect. And what I'm doing in here is I'm just simply uh, setting a background color. I'm going to make the border a line so I can kind of see it. And then what I'm doing is I still can access the property change events of that native control. So whenever it's focused, I'm going to change the color. I'm going to toggle it on or off here. So you can still access those inside of this effect. Uh, what I also have is I have this uh, uh, another effect called label shadow. I want to add a drop shadow onto this. This one's going to look pretty similar. I have this platform effect, and it's a label shadow effect. Now, this is going to be a little bit different. I'm giving it a lot of properties. I have a, a, a radius. I have a shadow color, a shadow offset. And what's intriguing here is that I also have this shadow effect dot get radius. So what I did is I extended like this, this background effect, very simplistic, just accessing it. But this one, I wanted to extend the control, any control, and add this background color. So inside the shadow effect, it's actually inside my shared code where I added bindable properties to extend controls. So inside of here, I have a has shadow, a color, and I'm essentially just describing the get and set colors and setting the view um, properties. So these are just extensions um, here. Now, uh, back over here, I can go ahead and ensure that whenever I update those properties with data binding, I'm updating the view. So now what this means is that I can go into my shared code, yet again, weather view, and I can come in, and the first thing I'm going to do is add the effects namespace here. So it's in effects in the weather assembly effect. And I'm going to come in and say entry.effects, and I'm going to say effects entry background effect. It's literally smart enough with our new IntelliSense to know all about that. 
Now, I could implement that on the other platforms if I wanted to, but right now it's only on this one, con this one control. Now, maybe I want to add a drop shadow onto another label. So whenever I get the, the, the temperature here. So what's nice is those are custom bindable properties. So I can come in and I can say effects. And when I say effects, it can find the shadow effect. And it can find all the properties, color, distance, has shadow, radius for me automatically. So I can get access to all those. I can even make them data bindable. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just copy a snippet here of the condition, because it's a little bit long. I'm just going to paste that in there. And what we're going to notice is that I have the shadow, the effect, and I can even use on property changes here to say it's black on iOS, it's red, or it's some other con color on UWP. So now what I've done is I export those. It knows the namespaces. I can automatically bring in those effects into my iOS application. So now it's going to go ahead and redeploy for me. There we go. And come into here. Now we have the border radius. When I tap on it, it changes to that purple color. When I say get weather, we're going to have that beautiful, we have that beautiful drop shadow here, easily extending it. It's not the most beautiful thing, but you get the idea that you can easily extend any of these controls with the symbol properties. You don't have to write tons of custom code to do it, to extend it. It's not a custom class. And these are shareable. You can nuget them up and share them immediately out to the world or throughout your company. All right. Now let's talk about accessing some native features. Now built in to Xamarin Forms, the toolkit itself are a bunch of platform optimizations and custom effects so you don't have to write them. We've done a bunch ourselves. And they're all documented on docs.microsoft.com. We have different ones for iOS, Android, and Windows. So for instance, we have custom blur effects. For the list view on Android, we have fast scrolling, so you can get the A, B, C, D, all the things coming on. An elevation property. We have pickers and page updates. And specifically around the iPhone X, or iPhone 10, as some people may call it, um, it has that notch in it. Same thing will be true on Android. There's going to be about 100 billion different Android devices with notches for no reason. But we've added, for instance, use safe area. And we have ways of setting navigation text colors and translucent things automatically. So for instance, if I want to set large titles on a list view on iOS, you would think, oh, I have to go create a custom render and effect. Oh my goodness, that sounds terrible. But no, it's built right in. You can just say navigation page on iOS, set prefer large titles to true. You can easily add this into the XAML by adding the iOS namespace. It's kind of interesting. You're like adding iOS specific things in your shared code. It's kind of weird, but it's awesome at the same time. You don't know why. Um, I love it. And what's cool here is we've also optimized this part. So if I go into my forecast page, I can come in here. Check this out. You can come in and say, I'm going to go X, M, L, N, S, iOS equals, and I'll say iOS. Like, I don't know what that is, but there it is. Boom. Right? And now I can say iOS. And there's all the things. Uh, this is going to be on my page, use safe area. James totally told me about that. And like you just found it. Like we're really improving our IntelliSense to make this a more uh, enjoyable uh, development experience. All right, nine, 11 minutes left. Let's just do this. All right. Not that one. Up, up. Now, I talked a little bit about accessing native features during the keynote with Xamarin Essentials. And I talked about this slide all these things that you also need to have access to in a Xamarin application. And in fact, you're going to need to do some custom work in your Xamarin Forms app. So often what you want to do is create an interface, maybe to get the preferences. I have some getters. I'm going to go create you know, the iOS, Android, and Windows version. It's like a renderer, but for code and platform-specific code. Now, the problem here is that you need some sort of dependency service. Xamarin Forms has that built in, and it's super highly optimized. Here, I can access native features um, using the built-in dependency service. You can export all of your dependencies at an assembly level, or you can register all of them manually. So you have your interface. You say dependency service get. Boom. You have your code. 
Now, what's great here is that it's crazy super fast. You're like, James, I use my autofac and my dry OC. Stop it. Stop. Slap. Don't do that. You don't need to because the Xamarin Forms one is super optimized for Xamarin apps. And you can see the performance done by a third party uh, on XamarinHelp.com of all the performance of how long it took to register and resolve types uh, in milliseconds um, here in code. And Xamarin Forms is the fastest to get access to that. And then you're saying, James, whoa, resolve with CI, which is constructor injection. You're like, whoa, where's that at? Well, it doesn't have that built in, but don't do that because I don't like that. So that's my, that's my assumption there. Just don't do that. Just say get. It's faster. But you can always use Xamarin Essentials and not worry about any of it. And we decided that, hey, what are the most popular things out there today that developers need access to? And that's why we created Xamarin Essentials for, this, uh, for any application, Xamarin or Xamarin Forms. So let me show you really quick what this looks like before we jump over to new in Xamarin Forms 3.0. So in this application, it's really simple. I showed the compass this morning, but check this out. The geolocation, I created a geolocation service, and that way I kind of have it in a separate assembly here. But here I'm using Xamarin Essentials. I'm saying, hey, let me get the last known position. If I have one, return it. Else, give me the location, time out over 30 seconds. Two lines of code, done. I can also get the address. So here I'm getting the place marks. I give it a position and I get an address back. What I like about this is that location and place mark are from Xamarin Essentials. All that code is right there. Same thing, settings plugin, preferences get, preferences set, done. Text to speech, speak async, done. And I just continue on with everything. What I like here and what I like to show off since I have a few more minutes here is that everything is open source. You can look at all of it here on our GitHub on Xamarin slash essentials. But everything is also documented. And it's first class. So when you tap on Xamarin, you're going to see Xamarin Essentials under Xamarin Forms, under Android, there it is, and under iOS. You can tap on Android or Xamarin Forms, any of them. It goes all to the same documentation. You want to get started? Here it is. It tells you what we support, how to install it, on Mac, on PC, any setup that you may need to do. I'm interested in the connectivity. I tap on it, we give you any permission you need to add, copy and paste code. It's that simple. What's great here is if you use one API, everything else will be removed. We made it linker safe, so it's super highly optimized. So we're not always bundling every API in there. In fact, I took one of my more complex apps where I had a bunch of plugins um, that do very similar things that I, some I wrote and some of the community wrote, I removed them all out of this app. And what I found out is that I ended up replacing them with Xamarin Essentials, and I removed 12 assemblies from my app, and it also reduced my app size by half a meg for free, the same functionality, because we've optimized it so much with the core platform, which is awesome. That did a few things. It optimized my startup time because Xamarin Forms doesn't have to scan my assemblies, made my app smaller, and it's a one single thing that I have to learn with the API. Awesome. All right, let's jump into some new hotness in my last few minutes here. Xamarin Forms 3.0. This just came out a few weeks ago at Build and has some awesome features built in. But first and foremost, we focused on performance. That was the biggest thing that we did. We've upgraded under the hood to .NET Standard 2.0 which is the big thing. We do have a backwards compat for PCL and .NET Standard 1.0. We recommend upgrading here. This gives tons of performance boosts as we've opted, in, opted into the core platform and simplifies our build process and your build process. We've also added compile bindings, so you can not only compile your XAML, but also your bindings. We introduced two concepts to optimize the view in your hierarchy automatically. One's called fast renderers. One's called layout compression. Fast renders, these are both opt-in. Fast renderers, we have a few of them, a fast button, a fast image, and a fast label. And the idea is that we remove a bunch of junk that you may not need, um, and it's super fast. Has the name, fast renderers. <laughs> it's fast. It's not slow renderers, it's fast renderers. And we also have layout compression. Layout compression is pretty cool. You can turn it on and off based on the, the page that you're on. Um, and what's nice here, as if you have a bunch of stack layouts or grids or a bunch of white spaces that are slowing down your app, at build time, we'll just remove it. We'll compress and flatten your layouts. We did an analysis where one page out of the box was rendering 280 controls. We turned on fast renderers and layout compression and we reduced it down to 90. 
and it looked exactly the same. It was beautiful. Tons of startup optimizations, Sam, XAML C improvements. Some bigger things I'll talk about in my last few minutes here is we've also added some major new features, some things and controls that will optimize your apps, but also for accessibility and right to left support. So let me start there with these four. The first one is Visual State Manager, something that the developers have been asking for for a long time and have been used to in the worlds of maybe WPF or UWP or Silverlight or Win basically any XAML ever. And for instance, you might be in landscape mode and you have your buttons on the right, but when you rotate your phone, you want to put it on the bottom, you want it to be different sizes back and forth. So how we do that is on any page, we describe uh, a style. So here I'm using a flex layout, which is new. I describe my list view groups. Here I'm saying it's an orientation state and I have portrait and landscape. And inside of there, I can say, what do you want to do? Like what properties do you want to set? So one I'm setting to column, one to row. Now in the code behind, you need to set these properties manually, which is nice because you can do anything you ever wanted. So maybe no network connection or maybe portrait or landscape. And here I'm actually using Xamarin Essentials to tie into the orientation whenever we rotate and set landscape versus portrait. So super easy to opt into. Next up is right to left. I'm not gonna get too um, deep into this, but the idea is that this is left to right, this is right to left, boom. See how it did there? Yeah, it's great. Now this is really important in, in markets that are speaking in right to left. Uh, and that's been really hard to do in the past with Xamarin Forms, you had a bunch of renders and effects. This is how you do it now. You set the flow direction to device.flow direction on any control that you want to have right to left and left to right supported automatically. Now you still need to do the translations and set up this stuff, but we have docs on that. That's all you need to do, one property. Pretty easy, we've tried to make it as easy as possible. Now my favorite stuff, flex layout and CSS. And some people are like, oh, CSS, gross. But no, it's awesome. Flex layout is amazing because list view, you have a list of things, but what if you wanna wrap things? You want them to be spaced and optimized and you want different sizes. It's really hard to do. And it's not performant, flex layout simplifies adapted layouts for all sorts of apps and for form factors. This is great when you're going from phone to tablet or other things. CSS can replace all of your XAML styles or live side-by-side -side XAML styles or you don't even have to use them, it's up to you. You can just not use them. But this is great if you're a web team that are also building apps with Xamarin because you can reuse some of your CSS or feel familiar and it's not very verbose. So let me show you what this looks like really quick as I jump over to my Mac. So uh, I'm gonna jump over here and maybe it'll come up, there we go. Now I'm gonna go ahead and open up this application in Visual Studio for Mac really quick and make this bigger. So what I have is the same exact uh, weather view. I have the previewer built in here and uh, ideally if this thing should load, we should be able to see our our previewer, come on. There we go, initializing the renderer. There we go. All right, all right, so this should be loading up. Now, a few things that I'm gonna do. First, I'm gonna come over into this. Uh, I think I might need to turn off, oh, that's there. Come on, there's my renderer. View, preview, or it's not gonna work. That could also happen. Come on. There we go, perfect, okay. So here's my flex layout, and we're gonna stop that. Now I have some columns in here. So what I can do in this flex layout is I'm adding a bunch of items in the code behind. So I can come and say row. And ideally, if I update this, you should see it update, or it's not gonna update. Flow direction, maybe wrap. Wrap, there we go. I got all work down there, but not up, there we go, okay. For some reason, I need to toggle. Well, there we go, good. So if I turn that off, this wrap, 
There we go. Now, so now it's updating. There we go. So I have now have it in a row. So now I'm going to add in some wrap, and it updates. So what's cool is that I have these segments, and I can do a bunch of other stuff here. So now I can say space around. I can say space between. And I can actually space out these items automatically, and it handles it for me no matter what, even when I go in different modes, and I can space these things how I want. Now, what's great is that I can put this in CSS, though. So I can have this all in one place reusable, and it can be in one place. So I actually add it as a style sheet. So what I can do is I can come say um, class, and I'll say container. There we go. And it automatically uses all the CSS automatically. Cool thing here on the view, I can say that button's really ugly. So let's go ahead and say class, and I'll say outline. There we go. Boom. I'm at zero minutes. Cool. Let's do it. Let's build everything. So that's flex layout and that together. All right, let's zoom through it. Boom, boom, boom. Ready? Negative one minutes. Everywhere. We talked about this. This is awesome. You want to put some Xamarin forms in it. This is how easy it is. You maybe have a native iOS app on the left. You can easily embed a page and still render the controls. You can say new page to UI view controller or to fragment. It's super easy. So we really see the blending of the world here. Now, this enables some scenarios like extending Visual Studio and Visual Studio for Mac. So we have an amazing developer that's actually extending and writing custom pages and extending it for Mac and PC to extend Visual Studio, which is cool. And in fact, we're coming to new platforms. We have a platform support page with everything outlined, including support for Tizen devices, which is over 50 million Samsung phones and TVs and watches. We also have contributing community with GTK Sharp and Mac OS and WPF. And more recently, ASP.NET with Xamarin Forms. So this is an example of extending and using XAML inside of an ASP.NET application to host these controls. And what's cool is that this is a simple list, but I podcast a lot, so I created my entire podcast network with Xamarin Forms. Because I don't know, I'm not an ASP.NET developer, but I can use XAML, and I can make a really pretty looking website in XAML. So I did it, uh, which I think is awesome. Some of these things are experimental, but you can see the power of where we're going. And with that, that's Xamarin Forms, how you can extend, optimize, and take it to a whole bunch of new platforms. Here's a bunch of resources, get access to the code and slides. And with that, thank you so much.